navigate it through Fond du Lac, okay, to find something to eat. And thanks for all coming back again. Um, for the afternoon, then, we're going to have Damon Reedy talk about cover crops in a different <coughs> perspective than some of the cover crops that you pro or talks that you've heard in the past. Um, and then after that, we will have Greg Olson, but uh, we'll start with Damon first. So thanks. Yeah, you bet. Uh, okay, so my name is uh, Damon Reby. I'm the president of Dairyland and Aviation, which is an aerial application company out of Wapan, Wisconsin. Um, I'm also the president of a Reby Spring Service, which is an aerial application company based at Plainfield and Clover. And between the two companies, uh, we operate seven airplanes and a helicopter. We do uh, primarily uh, aerial application of pesticides to uh, vegetable, forage, and grain crops. Uh, but starting in uh, 2010, we began doing aerial seeding, uh, interseeding all different types of seeds into many different types of crops. 2010 was our first year of doing it. We did uh, 68 acres that year. Uh, so that was our big, our big year in 2010. 2016 season was just over 15,000 acres. So it's a growing part of our business uh, and one that uh, we, we really, uh, it really fits well into our business model because it happens at a time of the year when our equipment wouldn't otherwise be used. A uh, little family history, uh, my grandfather started uh, his, the business that we currently operate, it, he called it Reby Flying Service. He started it right after World War II. Uh, where he was a pilot in World War II and he um, uh, got out of the service as a pilot and he uh, grew up near Iron Ridge, Iron Ridge Wisconsin and uh, he decided on the way back from uh, his service that he was going to start a flight school uh, in, in Wisconsin and so when he returned home he went to a I'm, I'm envisioning him with a Rand McNally and he looked at all the cities in Wisconsin that didn't already have an airport and he then picked from those cities the one with the highest population of people because he thought you know what this will work good I just got to get where I don't have another already an airport and you know and I already have an operator and the biggest number of people there so that I can get as many students as I can to make a living at running a flight school. So he did just that. He, he looked it up and he determined that Wapan, Wisconsin had the highest number of people uh, and it didn't already have an airport. And so the first thing he did was he actually hitchhiked to uh, Pennsylvania, bought a brand new Piper Cub and flew that home and uh, opened up shop and he had one student that's all he had. And he asked his student, he says, I've been open for a month, and you're my only student. And he said, what, what, what is going on here? And so the fellow, Roger was his name, Roger said, Roy, how did you decide on Wapan? And he explained the process. And Roger smiled and he said, do you understand that the prison in Wapan is part of the population? <laughs> <laughs> So they didn't have any kind of program to let the prisoners out to get flying lessons. So he knew he had a pretty serious problem. He had set up shop there. And that next summer then he saw uh, some crop dusters that were actually doing dusting at the time for the canners in the same kind of airplane that he owned to give instruction in. And so the following winter, he bought another cub, went to some area canners, and asked them if they would hire him to do the dusting, and they agreed to do that. And so he put a wooden hopper in that airplane and taught himself how to dust, and that's how our business. Um, so that's kind of a little background and uh, the, the, the topic of the presentation on the agenda is the successes and failures of, of uh, aerial seeding cover crops and so we're going we're gonna to get right into the meat of this. Um, you guys are going to be able to learn how we can plant cover crops late in the fall and get them to, to grow fast enough to get hip high before we get a hard freeze up. And this is, this is a very technical process. Um, it's, it's really uh, kind of new in agriculture and I think you're gonna really like how we do it. The secret to hip high cover crops that are planted late in the fall is to find a short guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is my son, Max. And in that photo there, he's, um, 
He's three years old. So that photo was taken in about 2013, and the problem is I haven't been able to raise a hip-high cover crop since. He's now <laughs> seven, and he's now a little tall. So, uh, I, I like to do this, it's a fun joke and whatnot, but I also like that there's a serious part of this. When we're aerial seeding cover crops, we're doing it because we're out of growing season. That's why we're using the airplane. There isn't gonna be enough time once the crop is harvested to get a cover crop established. If, they're, if you're raising wheat, for instance, it would be foolish to broadcast the seeds with an airplane to establish a cover crop. It wouldn't, you, you'll have access to the land and you'll drill it, right? But in the case of silage corn or grain corn or soybeans, now what's gonna happen is this harvest is gonna happen late enough in the year, we can't get a cover crop going. I have this conversation because we wanna set expectations if we're gonna plant a cover crop on the 10th of September, you know, you look at last fall, there's an unusual fall and an unusual growing season, but we're not gonna have cover crops that are this tall, okay? A successful cover crop would be a grass species that maybe gets to be a foot tall. That would be something that we would really be uh, celebrating as, a, as an excellent uh, uh, stand and a successful establishment. So now we're gonna get to the actual what we're gonna talk about, right? Um, the topics of the conversation, I like to talk about what seeds work for aerial seeding. We want to talk about the importance of seed to soil contact when you're uh, making these decisions. The critical need for sunlight for these, uh, for these cover crops to be successful. And this is really key. I'm going to beat the sunlight thing to death. We're going to really hit that hard. Um, we're going to talk about other causes for stand failures that we've learned over the last several years. We're going, to, we're going to talk a lot about failures, but we do want to show you some pictures of when it works. Uh, we focus on failures because when it doesn't work, we need to know why it didn't work so that we just simply don't keep doing that again, right? It doesn't mean that it always fails. It just means that we have to be able to predict when this is going to work with some accuracy. Um, and then the final thing we're going to talk about as long as we have time is how we actually do the seeding. How does that airplane fly over the field at 150 miles an hour possibly put these seeds out in a uniform manner? And we're going to describe how we go about that. So we start with picking the correct seed. Um, the seeds that, that we're having really, really great success with in the, uh, in amongst the cereal grain family or the grass family is annual ryegrass, cereal rye, uh, uh, barley, spring barley, oats, wheat, any of those uh, cereal grains are gonna be uh, seeds that we have a high degree of success with. Uh, other seeds that we have very, it, they work very good when they're broadcast, but we don't do a lot of it because again, we're late in the season, so we're running out of time to put these seeds out and have them get to be any uh, any growth on them to be worth spending the money on would be the small seeded legumes and I, I put in clovers. Um, we've been doing a little bit with hairy vetch and we're having some pretty good luck with that. Uh, that would, I would call that kind of a medium seeded legume. Uh, and I'm gonna, as long as I'm talking about legumes, I'm gonna jump ahead to seeds that don't work. Large seeded legumes like peas, winter peas, Soybeans, when you broadcast those, the odds of that growing are really, really remote. Um, we're having good luck with all of the brassica species. Uh, turnips, uh, um, dwarf Essex rape, a lot of times called canola, and uh, of course the, uh, the radishes. So one thing to help you out in deciding if a seed will work is there's lots and lots of tools to decide if it's, if it's suitable for broadcasting. One of the easiest tools that you have access to as a grower is most drills have a chart of the planting depth that you should plant that seed in when, uh, right on your drill. And if that drill says that you can plant between a quarter and three quarters of an inch deep, it's gonna work when you broadcast. If it says that seed needs to be an inch and a half to two inches in the soil, it needs soil incorporation. And if you, if you really step back and think about it, 
that has nothing to do with aerial seeding. I keep mentioning we're broadcasting seed. Just think of the seeds that if you, if you spill them, which ones grow, right? Well, that's what we're talking about. Those are the seeds we want to focus on. Um, a pea seed, a soybean seed, a corn seed, right? Those need deep incorporation. They're not going to work when we broadcast. So that's kind of the mechanics of that, that part of picking, picking seeds that work. Now, once you understand what your options are, then you can start deciding what are your goals when you're, when you're making these decisions. And the first question I'll ask a grower when they're interested in, in using cover crops is this. Do you want the cover crop to overwinter or don't you? Because that gives you a horrendous amount of direction. If the, if the answer to that question is, I want it to overwinter, we can then head in a certain direction. That further categorizes what seeds we're gonna pick. If you say, no, I really don't want it to overwinter, now we head into a different direction. I put a few other things that you could ask yourself when you're making these decisions. Uh, you wanna ask yourself, do you wanna grow nitrogen? Right? So if we plant a legume, we can essentially affix nitrogen from the atmosphere. We're all familiar with how that works. So that, if that's your goal, now you know you have to pick those legume species. The question then you have to ask yourself is, if I do this planting, interseeding, on September 15th or September 20th, is there enough time to get that legume established and actually get enough growth out of it to, to actually generate that nitrogen? In a lot of cases, we don't really have the amount of time needed to really get things up and running. The exception to that would be silage corn. Silage corn affords us some opportunities when we're broadcasting that we don't have in grain corn and in soybeans. Next question I put up there is, do you want to raise feed? Right? If you want this cover crop to be a source of feed, well, that, that helps you decide what it is you're going to do. Once you've answered those questions, then you can kind of get down to the nitty gritty. And I'm just gonna throw up really my base recommendation. If you want it to overwinter, I just say, hey, let's use cereal rye. If you don't want it to overwinter, let's use spring barley. So you might be asking yourself, okay, you want it to overwinter, why did you pick cereal <laughs> rye over some other options? Some guys might say, I'd rather use winter wheat or I'd rather